Come on, you can be seated, man. We are so glad you're here. Man, that's, we prayed most of the day, prayed for weeks and months we've been praying, and man, um, man, I called our, the guy who's gonna bring God's word tonight. I didn't, when I thought about Reset, I didn't have to think hard who I would wanna be a part of this. You know, last, last night, Pastor Ken, and man, there were, so you're aware, there were thousands of names that were all across this stage. And tomorrow morning, back at prayer, they'll back out across this stage. This morning, as I stood about right here, about 6.42, I looked up at the clock. God just kind of put this amazing picture of what it, of the responsibility we have as a church. That we have a responsibility to those thousands of people that were named across this stage last night. To go, to love, and to serve, and to share. And so we will continue to pray, amen, for them in the coming days. But as I thought of the who I would want on night two, I mean, it didn't take me long to, to come to this name. Uh, he's become a very, very dear friend who has spoken life into Nicole and I. Uh, and man, it's just been an incredible journey for about three years now. Um, we've been hanging out, maybe four, actually four years. Uh, see, time flies when you're having fun. Um, and so, man, he's no stranger to the river. I think this is your, his second or third time with us. And so, uh, man, we wanna, I believe tonight that God has given him a word for you. He's given him a word for our church and I believe he's given him a word for our city. And I believe that what's going to happen in this room tonight is going to transform lives and transform family trees. And man, there's no better surgeon of, the, of God's word than I know and that I listen to than a, a man that I call a very, very dear friend. So can you give me a huge favor and get on your feet and welcome like he, the joke is, is I want you to give him a hill jack welcome. If you recall, last time I said, we're gonna give him a hill jack welcome. We've been laughing about that ever since I said that crazy comment. But can you get on your feet and welcome Pastor J.C. Worley to the river tonight? Go get him. I love you, man. Woo, come on, come on, come on. Now for Jesus, come on for Jesus, for Jesus, come on. Hallelujah. Ah, oh, do you love Jesus? Come on. Look at somebody and tell them, say, you're in the right place tonight. You are in the right place tonight. This is, this is family. This is, this is family. It feels good to be back with you all. Thank you for uh, the continual invitation to be a part of what God is doing here at the river. And I'll jump into the word here in just a moment, but I do want to give honor and this isn't like uh, the mutual affirmation of society where he says something about me, I got to say something about him. But our friendship is pure and genuine. And I just love your pastors. Do you love your pastors? Come on. Pastor Matthew, Pastor Nick. Come on, if you love them, let them know. I just love you so much, man. I'm so proud of you. You know, as a matter of fact, uh, during worship, just thinking about you and Nicole, uh, the one word that came to my heart, and there's many words to describe uh, the two of you and your ministry and your marriage, uh, but the word that I felt impressed to just publicly talk about is the word stewardship. And I know that's probably not a, a common used word about an uh, a, a affirmation or appreciation of a friend, but every time I come to this place, every time I'm around you all, I see the way that you steward with integrity. Look at what God is doing at the River Church. Every time I show up, it's under construction, you're expanding parking, it, there's bathroom, you know, toilets in the hall. I mean, there's always something going on. There's, there's painting, there's carpet, there's growth, there's a new gathering, there's a new outreach, there's a new initiative. And the way that you have stewarded that is just absolutely tremendous. And that's one part. But the second part is more important to me. And that's the way the two of you steward your family. You steward them really well. When I watch your children worship the Lord, serve the Lord, man, the way that you have continued to put them first, uh, that, that's a beautiful thing. You know, you can't, you can't be so spiritually minded that you neglect your first ministry, which is the family. In the beginning, God created the family unit. Come on, somebody. 
I'm just so proud of you guys for the way you've stewarded that. And you have great pastors. You're part of a great church. Um, if, I, if I lived in Marion, I'd be right here. Come on, somebody. I'd be right here. Um, it's a great church. So come on, one more time. If you love them, let them know. Come on. Adriana, Wyatt, Levi, Lydia, love you all. Night two. Come on, you ready for night two? Man, all, all I've heard all day long is how great night one was, and that made me think I should have, I should have been here last night because it's hard to follow a great night like that. I'm going to pray for you in a second, but if you have your Bibles, I want you to go to Luke chapter 15, the Gospel of Luke chapter 15. How about this worship team? Come on now. That's good. I can't even sing, but if I could, I'd be up here with them singing, man. They powerful, anointed, and uh, you can feel the, the presence of the Holy Spirit here. Luke chapter 15, uh, if, if, you've, if you're there, say, I'm there. If you need a minute, say, hang on, pastor. All right, Luke 15, open up your scripture, go to your smartphone. If you're using your, your Bible application, you know, just maybe flip the phone on airplane mode so you don't get distracted by text messages and where everybody's going out to eat after. Where do you eat after church on a Monday night in Marion? home. Where is it? That place sounds good to me. Let's all go there, okay? Pastor Matthew's buying in Jesus' name. <laughs> See, it's stewardship. It's stewardship. <laughs> in Luke chapter 15, there are three unique parables uh, that, that Jesus uh, teaches and tells. Now, a parable, as you know, is just a simple story told by Jesus to illustrate a spiritual lesson. So he would just tell a story to illustrate a, a spiritual lesson and a biblical principle. Now, all three of these parables in Luke chapter 15 are centered around something that's been lost. By a show of hands, how many of you have ever lost something of great value to you? Come on, you've lost, you've lost something. I lost my very first wedding band. Come on, anybody with me on that? I hope it was, man, I saw a couple ladies raise their hand. That's, that is of great value. Mine was titanium cheap. You know, Kimberly, my wife's ring, that was, that was worth a lot of money. She can't lose that. Anybody ever lose your cell phone? Come on, you lose your cell phone? You will lose your mind if you lose your cell phone. You can lose your kids and be like, I wonder where they are. But if you lose your cell phone, you will flip your house upside down looking for the cell phone. So here Jesus is talking about, you know, three different stories of things that are lost. And I'll give you a very quick rundown of all three of these parables. But before I do that, I just want to tell you that oftentimes when Jesus desired to talk about sin and salvation, he would use the metaphors of being lost and found. Does that make sense? So the, the first story here is about a shepherd who owns a hundred sheep. One of the sheep goes astray. One of the sheep gets lost. And so the good shepherd, what does he do? Come on, church. Leaves the 99 to go find the one, right? Then he tells the second story. The second story is about a woman who discovers that one of her coins is lost. Uh, something that's of great value to her. She, she loses it. And so... She begins to search everywhere uh, that she can think of in order to find this lost coin. And then the third story is the one that I want to sit on tonight. It's about two sons uh, who are in different ways both lost. But I'll talk specifically about the prodigal son. So Luke chapter 15 beginning in verse number 11. I'd have you stand for the reading of the word but you've been standing a while so just lean in with me okay. You ready? Verse number 11. If you're ready say I'm ready. A man had two sons. The younger of the sons said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate that belongs to me. I, I won't exegete all of the verses here, but I do think it's important to pause right here and tell you that at this point in Jewish tradition and history, if a son were to ask his father for his share or portion of the, the family estate before the father was deceased, that would be like saying to the father, I wish you were dead was a slap in the face. So the son goes to the father who's alive and he says to his father, give me my share of the estate that belongs to me. So the father divided his wealth among them, verse 13. Not many days later, the younger son gathered together everything that he had and he moved to a distant country. On the count of three, I want everybody to say those two words, distant country, one, two, three. If you're highlighting in your Bible, I want you to highlight those two words, a distant country. There in that distant country, he squandered everything with wild living. About the time that his money ran out, 
a great famine swept over the land, and he began to starve. He persuaded a local farmer to hire him, and the man sent him into the fields to feed the pigs. Verse 16. He would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, since no one was giving him anything to eat. Verse 17. This is a powerful reset in this story. This is a powerful moment of repentance and realization in this story. When he finally came to his senses, he said to himself, At home, even the hired servants have food enough to spare, yet here I am dying of hunger. I will go home to my father, and I will say, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you. I am no longer worthy to even be called your son. Please take me on as one of the hired hands, one of the hired servants. Verse 20. So he got up and he ran to his father. He came to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and filled with love and with compassion for him, he ran to his son and he embraced his son and he kissed his son. He didn't beat his son. He didn't put his son down. He didn't belittle his son. His arms were open wide and verse 21 says, and the son said to his father, father, I have sinned against heaven and I have sinned against you and I'm no longer worthy to even be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quickly, bring out the best robe, put it on him, put a ring on his hand and put sandals on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it because tonight we're having steak, medium rare. Come on, somebody, say a good amen right there. Let us eat, let us celebrate. Watch verse 24, watch. For this son of mine that was dead has come to life again. He was lost, but now he has been found. And they began to celebrate. I want to read verse 24 one more time. And I want every Christian, every born-again believer, everybody with a testimony. You you know what it's like to be lost and living for the world. But then you come to your senses and you come back to the arms of a loving father. I want you to help me preach verse 24. You ready? Let's let the word do the work today. But verse 24, for this son of mine, come on church, was dead, but he came to life again. He was lost, but he has been found, and they began to celebrate. Now, let's celebrate Jesus in his grace and his mercy. There's so much within these three parables and, and so much within the one specific parable that we just read about the prodigal son, but I want to focus in on two words. If I were to give this sermon a title, I would call it a distant country. I don't think you need to know this, but it will help me in my introduction here, and then I'll pray for us. I don't take a lot of preaching engagements like I used to. Number one, my my schedule is busy. I I, I pastor full-time. I got a growing church, and and those people and that team, they require my full-time attention. Secondly, I care a lot about my family and the the health of my family and my marriage. My wife, Kimberly, and I will be married 20 years in two months. Come on, can I get an amen from somebody? My kids are active in sports and in school, and so I I don't want to miss those moments because you only get those moments once. And uh, Anybody can pastor Go Church, but I can be the only dad to Lakeland and London, the only husband to Kimberly. So I don't travel a lot for those reasons, and thirdly, I don't travel a lot because I'm getting older, and I don't like to travel as much as I used to, and I don't like people like I used to like people. Can I, (laughs) is anybody with me on that? No, I like you all, but I don't know if you've been in this world lately, but this world is full of crazy there's some crazy people in this world. And if you're sitting there thinking, well, I wonder who the crazy person is. Hill Jack, it's you. Come on, somebody. Like, <laughs> so I, I don't travel like I used to travel. And now whenever invitations come, and, and they come, they still come. But I only take assignments. I only take assignments where I know that the Holy Spirit is releasing me to be in that moment, in that room, to bring a word. So I could bring, I preach every Sunday like your pastor does. I could bring you a canned sermon, one of my best sermons, and get a lot of amens and walk out of here with a few new Instagram friends. But I'm on assignment tonight. And I've got a word for this house, but I also believe it's a word for this community. It's a word for the people that don't even know that the river exists yet. It's a word for the people that don't even realize that there is a God who exists. And his love is great and his grace is wonderful. Can I get a witness from somebody who's experienced that? So I'm here on assignment tonight. I got a word for you. There are moments within this message it might feel a little confrontational. That's okay. I'm getting on an airplane tomorrow and I'm leaving. So it's just between you and Jesus. 
but I feel like doing uh, the work of the Lord tonight. Anybody with me? Let me encourage you to take notes. Uh, if you've got a, a access to your journal or your smartphone or maybe in a seat back pocket in front of you or near you, there's a slip of paper. I want you to write some thoughts down today. I know it's a Monday night. Uh, you've been at church all day yesterday into the evening. You got up early at 6 a.m. to be here for 21 days of prayer. You're coming back tomorrow. I don't plan to be behind this pulpit long, but I'll make you a deal. The more you amen, the faster I'll preach. Now nah, we're going to be here a minute. Come on, somebody. The more you amen, the faster I'll preach. Now that's about 10 minutes worth. So, all right, close your eyes, bow your heads for a moment. I'm going to give you about 10, 15 seconds here just to focus in on the Holy Spirit, the word of the Lord and what he would speak to you. Removing all distraction and all fleeting thoughts that the enemy would love to just put into your mind to steal this moment. In these few seconds, I just want you in your heart of hearts to say, Father, you're here, I'm here, so meet me at the point of my need. I don't want to walk out of this room the way I came in. I want to walk out different, closer to you than I've ever been before. I need a reset in my life, in my mind, in my heart, in my marriage, in my family, in my body, in my finances, whatever the need is. Come on, take 10 seconds. I'll pray for you. Father, I echo the words of the Apostle Paul that he told the church at Corinth. For I do not preach with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Holy Spirit's power. I need the power of the Holy Spirit on my life today. While I'm full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit, I'm also human and I'm tired. My voice is tired, my body is tired, but my faith is strong. Your people are here tonight. They've push through exhaustion and fatigue and the challenges of the day and the hustle to feed the family or to get off work and to get here. So we're pushing, we're making sacrifices to be in your presence. And I know, Jesus, that when, you, when you're in the room and when we're in the room, everything we need is available. So whatever the needs are in this room today, if it's salvation, salvation can be found in the presence of Jesus. If it's deliverance, deliverance can be found in the presence of Jesus. If it's healing, healing can be found in the presence of Jesus. Whatever the need is, it can be met and found in your presence. So anoint us tonight. Let the seed of your word be deposited in the soil of every single heart. I don't stand on this stage to try to impress people. When you called me to preach at 19 years old, that was a long time ago now, you put this word in my heart that it's not my desire to impress people, it's my desire to impact people. And the only way that I can do that is through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So I say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. And you get all of the glory and you get all of the honor. I've got one job tonight, and that is to lift up Jesus. You say in your word, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all people unto myself. So we lift high the name of Jesus because there is none like you in all the earth. And somebody with great faith said a good amen. And one more time, let's bless King Jesus together. Come on, church. Woo. Oh, I feel like preaching. I think I'm, I think I'm gonna preach tonight. Is that all right? I am your pastor's very best Pentecostal friend. Come on, he needs a good Pentecostal friend in his life. I'm gonna preach the word tonight. A distant country, a distant country. I think that for the majority of us in this room, for almost every single one of us that call this church home, you probably, in some way, shape, or form, have an understanding of what it means to be in a distant country. I'll give you a few examples. For some of you, your family's origin started in a different land. And at some point, they came over to America to establish a new beginning in a land of opportunity. How many of you, you know that to be true? If you've ever done Ancestry.com or something like that, okay. Uh, my, my wife's dad is from Trinidad, a little Caribbean island right there surrounded by the Caribbean Ocean. Why didn't the Lord call us to pastor a church in the Caribbean? Come on, somebody. He's from Trinidad. But when he was a kid, his mom and father, they relocated to the United States of America. And so my wife grew up in, in Georgia, which is where we live now. But they're from Trinidad, a distant country. 
Some of you have uh, relatives or you yourself served in the military. And so you were stationed in a distant country. You did time overseas. As a matter of fact, at Go Church, we always give honor to the brave men and women that serve in the military and all of our first responders. If that's you, military men, women, veterans, or active duty first responders, would you put your hand up for a moment? I want this room to show high appreciation. Come on. Come on. Thank you. So you, you've served overseas, and so you know what it's like to live in a distant country for a period of time. Many of you, if you're fortunate enough, you've taken a, a, a vacation of some sort that has led you outside of Marion, outside of Indiana, outside of the continental USA, and you've gone to like an all-inclusive resort. Come on, somebody. How many of you, by a show of hands, you're like, I love church, and I'm glad I'm here, but I'd love to be in an all-inclusive. Come on, can I get it? Jesus is there. He is there. Come on. His spirit is everywhere. And so you know what it's like in the physical to be a part of or to visit or to be from a distant country. But I want to talk to you for a few minutes about the thought of what it's like to live in a distant country from a spiritual perspective. Through the spiritual lens of being far from God. I think it's really important that you are able to identify your spiritual condition. The Apostle Paul, when he wrote the letters to the churches, which by the way, when you read like uh, Ephesians, Galatians, Philippians, Corinthians, all of those are just letters that the Apostle Paul wrote to the churches of Ephesus and Philippi and Corinth and Rome. Does that make sense? And so when you read these letters over and over and over again, the Apostle Paul wrote about the importance for us to, ha to take a spiritual assessment of our life, to take a spiritual examination, to search the spiritual condition of our heart and determine where we are with Christ Jesus. Are we walking with Jesus and living with Jesus, or have we just kind of wandered away from him and drifted away from him. And over and over and over, in the New Testament specifically, God calls us to a place of repentance and a reset. That if in a moment of your self-assessment you realize, I'm living spiritually in a distant country, then all you have to do is open up your heart, open up your mouth, confess those sins, receive Christ as Lord, and be drawn back into the arms of a loving Father. Here's what it's like potentially to live in a spiritual distant country, you feel like God is far away from you. You feel like God will never forgive you for all the wrong that you've done. You're tired emotionally and spiritually. You're just going through the motions. You're reading your Bible and you're showing up for prayer, but you feel nothing. Some of you, maybe you feel at rock bottom. You've run out of options. You're stuck. You're in a rut. The idea of Jesus is intriguing to you, but you're not in a personal and growing relationship with Christ. The, the parable that we just read in verse 13, 14, and 17 identifies four very specific outlines of what it's like to live in a spiritual distant country. Verse 13. When you're living in a distant country away from God, it's wild living. I've been there before. Verse 14, it's full of famine. Verse 14, it's starvation. Verse 17, it leads to death. Now, as we put those bullet points together, all of a sudden, maybe you start to realize, you know what, maybe I am living in this distant country. Let me talk about the distant country with three thoughts, all right? Now, I'm talking to every person in this room, but there are a, a, a significant amount of young people, middle school, high school, college, young adult. And so I really want that age group or those individuals to lean in because you're just now beginning uh, your life. How many of us, we got a little season to our life? Come on, season saints, where are you at? I know you thought when I showed up that I grayed my beard or I dyed my beard gray, but this is real. Come on, somebody, I earned this now. I'm getting old, it's happening. You know, but if you, if you lived a little through life's experiences, you've got a little wisdom and a little maturity. It doesn't mean that we're exempt from foolishness and stupidity and drifting away, but you understand what it's like to live for the world 
and then the importance of living for Jesus. Can I get an amen from some people that know what I'm talking about? But for the younger generation, I really want you to lean into this message because this is what the enemy is trying to do. The enemy is trying to get you away from the covering of your heavenly father, away from the covering of the local church, and bring you into this distant country. The first thought is this. A distant country is filled with deception. It's full of deception. If I came here tonight for any reason, if I flew on a small aircraft from Atlanta to Fort Wayne, Indiana, and then rode with your pastor, I put my life in his hands for one hour. Can I get an amen from somebody that's ever ridden with this guy? Have you seen the back of his truck right now? Come on. Well, he, anyway, I'll keep going. If I came here for any reason tonight, it's to tell you that it is the nature and the character of Satan himself to be deceptive. It's who he is. The, the Bible tells us that Satan has been a liar from the very beginning of time. And his very first appearance in Scripture comes under the deceptive guise of a serpent. Genesis 3, verse number 1, look what the scripture says. That the serpent was more cunning, more deceptive than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. See, the primary job of the devil, the number one goal of the devil, all day, every day, is to lure you and to entice you and to tempt you and to pull you into a distant country that is full of deception. And the enemy will use everything in his arsenal in order to accomplish that primary objective for your life. He wants you away from God. The enemy doesn't play to your strengths. No. The enemy plays to your weaknesses. And I'm not giving the, the, the devil credit that he doesn't deserve. But he's not ignorant with his tactics. Now, his tactics don't change. They're the same schemes and same plots as they were in the very beginning with Adam and Eve. But he knows your weaknesses. He knows your propensities towards doing wrong. It's why you stay stuck in a habitual cycle and pattern of addiction and decision-making and generational curse. Because the enemy is using those very vices, those very things to deceive you, to leave your faith and move to a distant country. He plays off your weaknesses, hoping that one day you'll buy into the lies. You'll pack up your bags. You'll deconstruct in your faith. You'll get angry with God, and you move to a distant country. James 1.14 says it like this. This is the half-brother of Jesus, by the way. James says, every person is tempted when they are, watch the visual language that James uses about the deceptive tactic of the enemy. Each person is tempted as they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it's full grown, gives birth to death. Now watch what he says in verse 16. I know it's not on the screen. I'm just reading the scripture to you. But what James says in James 1 verse 16 is my prayer for you tonight. Don't be deceived. Brothers and sisters, don't be deceived. Don't let the distant country deceive you. You know, I hear people say all the time, and I watch as individuals fight against the, the, the temptation of the enemy because the devil will make them think, well, the grass is greener on the other side. And that's not true. The grass is always greener where you water it. Are y'all going to help me preach tonight or am I up here by myself? Come on. The grass is always greener where you water it. And, and people buy into this life that, or this lie rather where the enemy says life is better over here. See, outside of God and outside of the church and in this distant country, the enemy will tell you, that, that, listen, young people, there are no rules. There are no responsibilities. There are no consequences. Over here, you can be whoever you want, live however you want, act however you want, do however you want. Over here in the distant country, away from God, you can... 
You can live it up with wild living and you can enjoy your life. You don't have to be under the, the, the oppression of a God that would place rules on you. Listen to me. Lies, lies, lies. They're all deceptive lies. Let me tell you about my own testimony. Years ago, when I allowed the lies of the enemy to deceive my mind, I bought what the devil was selling. It led me to a place that I never even thought existed. I was lonely, I was broken, I was lost, I was bound, I was addicted, all because I believed that in this distant country that that life away from God would be better than a life with God. And man, let me tell you, I regret those gap years. I regret those years that I ran from God and I lived for the world. I regret those years that I spent with my face in mud eating the, 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 the food of pigs, when in those years I could have been living in the master's home. Come on, somebody. Living with my father, but I bought into the lies of the enemy, and I thought, you know what? I know what's best for me, and we really don't know what's best for us. I think when I was here for the men's conference some months back, I talked about how on the inside of every one of us there are these two dogs at war and every day we wake up, these dogs are fighting each other. It's the dog of the flesh versus the dog of the spirit. And which dog will win the fight of the day? The one you feed the most. And if you feed that dog of deception, that will trick your mind into believing that life is better outside of this covering. Look at somebody that's been there and done that. Life is not better outside of the covering of your Father in heaven. Life is so much more better when you're in the presence of God, in corporate worship, in corporate prayer, in the presence of the Father. Let me get a hundred people to give me a good amen. It's deception. It wasn't very long after I got there I realized I'd been deceived. Wasn't very long after I moved into that house with those guys I never should have moved in with that I had been lied to. Wasn't very long after I became addicted to drugs and alcohol that I realized, oh, I'm in it now. Now what? Here's what I've learned if you're taking notes. It won't be on the screen, but I, I urge you to write this down. Whenever we run towards deception, it will always lead to destruction. That's the second thing I want to pull out of this story. I told you that a distant country is filled with deception. Secondly, the distant country leads to destruction. Do you ever wonder why the enemy is so hard after you? Why the enemy is so hard after your family, after your marriage, after your mind, after your finances, after your health, after your body? The answer is this, and it's very simple. It's destruction. The enemy's desire is to see you completely destroyed. And everything and everyone that's close to you, everything that matters to you, the goal of the devil is destruction. See, you have a calling on your life. You have a purpose on your life. You have an assignment from God on your life. I told my church this yesterday. Let me challenge you with a thought here. I don't believe that God created you and then gave you a purpose. I believe God had a purpose, and so he created you. Woo! God had a purpose. So he knit you together while you were in your mother's womb, and he gave you every grace gift that you need in order to accomplish the very assignment, purpose, and destiny that is on your life. Jeremiah 29, 11. I'll take it out of context just a little bit, but give me grace. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you, but to give you hope and to give you future. But you think the enemy is going to sit back and let you walk in your anointing? Let you walk in your gifting? Let you walk in your assignment? Absolutely not. The goal of the devil is to deceive you, to destroy you. And watch this. The greater the battle, the greater the calling. That's why some of you and your families, you've been through so much generation after generation of spiritual warfare because if you ever get freedom if you ever get breakthrough if there's ever a true reset what God can do in you and through you would change the kingdom of heaven come on somebody with great faith everybody good if you're good say I'm good I'm not mad I'm just passionate about this 
Man, I, I'm frustrated at the deception of the enemy and, and, and individuals and families that are being destroyed because of the spiritual warfare. Ladies and gentlemen, this, this is how we fight our battles. This is how we fight our battles. Do you get that? John 10, 10 says this, and I want you to see uh, the mission of Satan and the mission of Jesus right here. John 10, 10. The thief comes to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. That's his mission. That's his goal. To deceive you, to destroy you. Now watch what Jesus says. But I have come that you might have life and have it to the full. Another translation says it this way, and I love, I love this word. I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Anybody want a full life in Christ? Anybody want an abundant life in Christ? Come on, I know it's a Monday night, but lean in here with me. See, the goal of the enemy is to watch your life become totally and completely destroyed. But the goal of Jesus is to see your life totally and completely fulfilled. And just like God has a plan for your life, so does the devil. Still, kill, destroy. Satan desires to deceive you so that he can destroy you. And if he can't get to you, he'll just get close to those that are close to you. Your family, your children, your health, your calling, your anointing, your joy. Your life, he's seeking whom he may devour. I told Pastor Matthew today, and we're talking just about raising kids. I've, I've never had a 14-year-old high schooler before. This is, this is a whole new territory for me. I, I've never had a, a nine-year-old little girl that's in the fourth grade. That's a whole new world for me. And now, all of a sudden, she's got like this cute little attitude. She's nine going on 19. Come on, parents, where are you at? And, and I'm watching, especially with, listen to me high schoolers real quick. I'm watching how the enemy is after my son's calling, my son's anointing, my son's gifting. As he places individuals. Now my son's got to work out his own salvation with fear and trembling. And that boy loves Jesus. But the enemy is putting people and things and opportunities and sin in front of him to deceive him, to, to take the bait, to come to the distant country. And now my son is only 14, and so there's great, and I'm not being disrespectful to him, but there's great immaturity in his little 14-year-old brain. He thinks he knows everything, but really he knows nothing. Come on, parents and grandparents. And so it's my job. I sat him down the other week and I said, son, listen to me. It is the desire of my heart to one day be your very best friend. But right now I am the priest of this home. I am the pastor of this home. And I anoint him with oil. I plead the blood of Jesus over him. Come on, if I see him out in public, I'm like, Lakeland, walk in the gift, walk in the anointing. And I know he's like, oh, Lord, Jesus, Daddy. But God's <laughs> hand is on that boy's life. And look at me, and then you can clap. And if the, as a matter of fact, I'm going to put the devil on notice right here, right now. If you come after my kids, you're going to have to get through me. Come on, somebody. You come through me first. A man full of faith, a man full of the Holy Spirit, a man full of the Word. You get to my wife, you get to my kids, you come through me and Jesus first. I'm not going to lay down and let the devil come after my family without putting up a fight. Can I get a hundred people ready to fight the enemy? No, no, no. You can come to still kill and destroy, but I got Jesus. The Bible says, greater is he on the inside of me than he that's in the world. I wish you'd rise up in your anointing. I wish you'd rise up in your faith. I wish you'd rise up in the Holy Spirit and say, devil, you can't touch my family. Devil, you can't touch my body. Devil, you can't touch my mind. I'm walking in the calling of God, the anointing of God, the grace of God, and I will not be destroyed. My Bible promises that through Jesus, I can and have life and have it to the full. Come on, help me preach. I can have a full life. You don't have to stay bound. You don't have to stay addicted. You don't have to stay broke in any way that you define that. You don't have to stay depressed. You don't have to stay anxious. You don't have to stay fearful. 
When you look at this world and everything that's happening, you can't get on social media or watch the news without them saying that World War III is coming. We don't know who's going to be the next president of the United States of America. But I got good news for you. It doesn't matter if they're Republican or Democrat. We serve the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It doesn't matter what happens in the world around us. My confidence and my hope is not in a man. The Bible says in Psalm 118 verse 8, it is better to put your confidence in God than it is to put your trust in man. My hope is in the Lord and the Lord alone. And for me and my house, we're going to serve King Jesus. Can I get a witness? Oh, I got to hurry. I got to move. I got to move. Watch 1 Peter 5 verse number 8. Be alert and of sober mind. This is why some of you need to sober up. And the Lord can help you to do that. And this church has great systems to do that. Be alert and of sober mind because your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. You've got to be alert. You've got to be aware the enemy is after us. Do you, do you think that this church does reset nights and 21 days of prayer because they don't think you're busy enough? By a show of hands, how many of us are busy? Come on. Oh, I thought it was just me. I'm shocked. We're all busy. But we do these reset nights and we do 21 days of prayer at 6 a.m. for 21 days because this is war. This isn't a game. We're not playing church games. We're not playing patty cake with the devil. This is war. And I've just decided that, man, for me and my family, for me and my church, if we're gonna, war, if we're gonna go to war, then we're gonna go to war with spiritual weapons. And the weapons are not the weapons of this world. Come on, somebody. This, isn't, this is war, this isn't a game. Look back at the parable that we just read. The youngest son fell into this trap of deception. His life was completely destroyed. He goes from living in a mansion to living in mud. He goes from having family and friends to having no one. He goes from extreme wealth to welfare. And you know what's the saddest of all of it? He made that decision. He made that choice. Let me submit to you this. God did not create us to be machines. We're not robots. Machines do what they're supposed to do, and they never do anything different. Machines have no character. They have no soul. Machines have no personality. A machine can't experience joy or excitement or pleasure. We can. You ever been to a vending machine, and you press B12, and it pops out, what's your favorite vending machine snack? Come on, tell me. You ain't going to say nothing like you ain't never been to a vi uh, vending machine. Give me a Twix. Come on, somebody. Give me a bag of Lay's potato chips. Now, when you press that and that comes out, you're like, woohoo. But you know what that machine does? Nothing. Because it has no personality. It's got no character. Machines lack self-awareness and consciousness. They have no relationships. A machine has no sense of priorities. They a machine doesn't make plans for the future. That vending machine doesn't say to the other machine, you know, one day I'm going to be a Coke machine. <laughs> it can't do that. They don't get to experience the satisfaction of accomplishment. Why? Because they don't have free will. So you know what God did? Instead of creating machines, God created man. And in Genesis, the Bible says that in the beginning when God created man, he breathed his ruach. That's the Hebrew word for spirit, the breath of God. And here's how it sounds. You ready? Ruach. The breath of God. And when the breath of God, oh, I feel like preaching this word. Come on, church. And when the breath of God entered that dirt, man became a living being. The Spirit of God birthed into man, and man became fully alive. And the Holy Spirit who brought man to being allowed us the ability to think and to reason 
and to make our own choices, at some point, this is going to be one of those moments a little confrontational, at some point, you have to stop pointing your finger at everybody else for your own issues. And you have to take responsibility for where you are in this life and also know that through the power of the Holy Spirit, through a personal and growing relationship with Jesus, you can reset that whole thing. Let me get somebody to testify that knows exactly what I'm talking about. Now, I'm not, look at me, I'm not where I, I need to be, but thank God I'm not who I used to be either. There came a moment where I realized God has given me the ability to think reason and make my own choices and then he gave us the power of the holy spirit a power that is far greater than your own power and the same power that is alive on the inside of you is the same power that raised jesus's lifeless body out up from that tomb then he gave us the bible And the Bible is God's word rightly divided. It's his word rightly divided so that we know how to live this life according to morals and ethics and values. Dear Lord, does this world need greater biblical values and Christian ethics and, and morals? He gave us his word so that I might hide myself in your word so that I don't sin against you, oh Lord. But he allows you to decide whatever you want to do. You get that decision. You're not just a puppet or a machine. You're a man and a woman. Which, by the way, if God made you a man or a woman, that is who you is. That's who you are. Because God maketh no mistake. You are no mistake. You are perfectly created in the image of God. So he allows us to decide, will we obey him and follow him and trust in him and lean on him? I wish somebody would have told me this at 13 years old, that if I run from God, there will, listen to me, don't miss it, there will always be consequences for every decision that I make. For every action, there is a reaction. And one of the first lessons that you'll learn about the law of consequences is this. Write it down. It won't be on the screen, but it's worth writing down. Good choices bring about good results. But bad choices bring about destructive results. Proverbs 14 says it like this. There is a way that seems right unto a man. But in the end, it's the way of death and destruction. And see, this is what the enemy really desires to do is to make you think that the way that you're going is the right way. But let me tell you, that way that you're going outside of God, it will always lead to death for the wages of sin is death and destruction. So I'm going to ask you the most important question anybody can ever ask. When it comes to your spiritual life, where are you living? Are you in a distant country? Away from the Lord, maybe you chose that life or maybe you drifted away. Maybe you just bought the deceptive lives of the enemy and he lured you in. But whenever we run towards deception and it leads to destruction, here's the truth. You ready? The Father wants you to come home. You can come to the keys. I'll give you one more thought here and I'll I'll pray for you. The third thought is this. The first one, the distant country is filled with deception. The second, the distant country leads to destruction. But the third, the distant country is not too distant after all. When I was 19 years old, running from God, angry at God, bound by alcohol and drugs and addiction, a lifestyle that had led me down a fast track to nowhere. I was discouraged and depressed at the lack of future that I had, the lack of promise that I felt. And what was interesting was is that in a season, and I know some of you know what I'm talking about here, but in a season when I had a lot of money, man, I had a lot of friends. 
But then when I lost all that money, I lost all those friends. <laughs> and I was broken at rock bottom. I was bartending on the weekends at a restaurant in Florida. And I was offered a job with a commercial landscaper to cut some grass and grew up in Tampa. So I took this job. It didn't pay much, but it was consistent cutting the Orange Hill Cemetery in Tampa, Florida. That cemetery was 19 and a half acres, almost 50,000 graves. And the job was very straightforward. You start on Monday, you cut all week, you get the weekend off, and you start back over on Monday. And this was a long time ago. It was 1999. Come on now. This was a generation where we didn't have cell phones. Now, I know some of you students are like, wait a minute. There was a time in our world's history that there were no cell phones. Yes, and you know what us old people call it? The good old days. Come on, somebody. Amen. Yeah, yeah, that was the good old days. We had to take my son's phone away the other day because he's an idiot. I love him, but he's an idiot. And my wife said, well, I know, I know this is right. I know we got to take the phone away, but how will we reach him if we need him? That's a good question. And I just simply said, I'm not sure, but my mom and dad figured it out. Come on, how many of you know? Like, I don't know. It may have been two or three days before I saw my parents, but eventually we were all back together, you know? <laughs> You'd go home and your parents would be gone. They would have gone on a vacation without you and your neighbors would have said, hey, you're staying with us for 14 days. And you're just like, I'm gonna roll with it. How many of you remember that? Come on. I don't even know what I'm talking about right now. I was out in the cemetery cutting grass. I, I didn't have a cell phone. I didn't have Spotify. I had a little Walkman. Come on, I had a little Walkman, probably listening to some boys to men. It's 1999, baby. And I, I'm thinking about my life, angry at God, mad, broken, hurt, discouraged, lost. I had nowhere to go. And I remember riding on that red snapper lawnmower, just contemplating my future, and there wasn't much to it. I barely graduated high school. And now I'm following the same path, the same trajectory as generations of Whirlies. That's my last name before me. When all of a sudden, in the middle of that cemetery, I felt the Holy Spirit just begin to move. I, I felt the Holy Spirit. And I don't know if I, I said this at the men's conference or not, if I told this but I'm too afraid of God to lie to you. And if I told you the story, then I can back it up by telling you it again. And it's the same story. <laughs> the power of God hit me so strong that I fell off of the lawnmower. And I was laying face down in the cemetery. I wasn't out of my mind because I looked up and I saw the lawnmower kept cutting. <laughs> and I laid face down and I just began to weep and cry. And for the first time in my life, I heard the auditory voice of God, the audible voice of God. And the only part that was audible was this. Are you ready? JC. JC. And I knew immediately that it was the Holy Spirit, that it was my Father in heaven calling me. And I had on that fall day in September of 1999, I had a Paul on the Damascus Road experience. On that day, I gave my heart to Jesus. It was a full, look at me, it was a full reset. I gave my heart to Jesus. I was filled with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and I started speaking in tongues, which I never, I didn't even know anything about because I didn't grow up in a church like that. I was called into the ministry, and then I was completely delivered from alcohol and drugs, completely delivered from a life of addiction. <laughs> Fully, come on, that's my story. Come on, if you got a testimony, come on, like, God did it in a moment. And here, here's what I learned. It's that even in the distant country, the enemy makes you think that, man, it's so hard to get to God. It's so hard to get back to the Father. It's so hard to get up from the, the dark place of sin and brokenness and despair and dirt. I had so much dirt on my life. I was so ashamed of what I had done and things I had done. I was so dirty and broken. And the enemy said, God will never love you 
God will never accept you. So you know what? I believe that. So I just kept doing the same thing over and over and over again. And with every bottle I drank, I felt as empty as the bottom of that bottle until that day. In that moment, I realized this distant country is not too distant after all. The Bible says that Jesus is just as close as the very mention of his name. That all I have to do, no matter where I am or where I've been or who I've done or what I've done, all I have to do is cry out, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, I love this story in Mark chapter 10 of blind Bartimaeus. Jesus is coming through Jericho, and blind Bartimaeus can't see in the natural, but in the spiritual, he knows that Jesus is coming. And he cries out with everything inside of him, every fiber in his being, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And you know what your Bible says? That Jesus stopped. He stopped and he said, Bring him to me. Oh, I wish that somebody here tonight would realize that this distant country that you're living in, you're not too far from the Father. All you have to do is cry out to Jesus. Jesus, 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 sweetest name I know. Fills my every longing, keeps me singing as I go. Jesus! And in a moment when you call on Jesus, his grace and his mercy will surround you. Listen to me, when it comes to the love of God, no matter what you've done or where you've been or where you are right now, look at me real quick. Look at this preacher. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. Well, back it up with Bible, Pastor JC, Romans 8. What can separate me from the love of God? Nothing can separate you from God's love. God loves you. And this prodigal son, that's us. It's our testimony. It's our story. He realizes in that moment, what am I doing here? Why am I living like this? In my father's house, in my daddy's arms, back in the covering of the family. Oh, life was so much different. And all you have to do is reset. All you have to do is reset. Let me show you really quickly. This will be on the screen how, how, how easy this is. You ready? You repent. You return. You reset. That's it. No matter where you are, no matter how broken you feel, lonely you feel, dirty you feel, worthless you feel, you just repent. You know what true repentance is? It's not just feeling sorry for what you've done true repentance is I'm getting up from where I am and I'm going in the opposite direction it's a 180 I'm going all the way in the opposite direction I'm repenting and then I'm returning do you see the image of the parable Jesus says that while the son was still a ways off the father saw it and what was the posture of the father arms open wide you know when you see that again in scripture was when Jesus was on the cross I tell my kids, especially when they were smaller, this all the time, you know how much Jesus loves you? He loves you this much. See, when he was on the cross, you were on his mind. Well, with every whip, with every nail, with every beating, with every curse word that they put on Jesus, he did it for you to give you a moment where you could repent and return and reset that distant country. Nah. It's not too distant after all. Let me say this and I'm done. I don't know why Jesus has put up with me as long as he has. Can I get an amen from somebody about your own life? But I'm so grateful that he loves me still. I'm so grateful, close your eyes for a second, that he looked beyond my fault and he saw my need. Just come home. Just come home. Just come home. (laughs) Ye who are weary, come home. You've been running. You've been angry. You've been broken. 
You've made mistakes. You've bought into the lies and the enemy has tried to destroy you. But you're not done yet. I love the song that we sing at Go Church and maybe you sing it here. If I'm not dead, it's because God, you're not done. There's still blood flowing in your veins. There's still oxygen in your, your lungs. God's not done with you. And you have free will right here, right now to choose life with Christ, life with God, or to keep living in that distant land. I don't know if this has helped you, but it has helped my soul tonight to be reminded of how I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Come on, I want you to stand with me all around this room. And for those of you that are in the faith, you, you've been baptized into the family of God. You've been adopted into the family of God. I just want you to lift your hands in a, 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 a posture of thanksgiving. Come on, just begin to tell them, say, thank you for saving me, Jesus. Come on, I want every Christian, raise your volume above a notch. Say, thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for not giving up on me. Thank you for choosing me. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. Thank you. Yeah, I love that, Pastor. Thank you for picking me up, turning my life around. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that you put within me. Oh, here's one. I thank you for your word. Oh, I wish you'd fall in love with his word. Oh, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your word. I need your word in my life. And I choose you, Jesus. I choose you, Jesus. Now, for those of you here that you've not yet accepted Jesus, would you come home? Would you come home? Come on, close your eyes for a moment around this whole room. If you've got a lost loved one, son, daughter, grandson, granddaughter, neighbor, if that's you, I just want you to raise your hand. Come on, just begin to intercede for them. Come on, I want you to pray at the level of your passion to see their salvation. Come on, call them by name. God, I pray for Stephen, my brother. I pray for my brother. He needs you. He needs you. Come on, just say their name. Say their name. Come on, I call them out right now. I pray that wherever they are, whatever they're doing, Lord, I pray that Stephen would wake up, come to his senses, and realize that he's not that far from you. That he can repent, he can return, he can reset. Because God, if you did it for me, you can do it for them. Come on. If you gave me grace, you can give them grace. If you gave me mercy, you can give them mercy. If you could love me, you could love them. Because there's nothing too dirty that you can't make worthy. Wash me in mercy and I'll be clean. I'll be clean. Come on, let's begin to worship team here. And here's what I'm going to invite you to do. This is going to take a great step of faith. It's going to require some of you to get a little uncomfortable. If you need to come home to Jesus, I'm counting to three. You come to these altars. I don't, this altar, I don't care if it's one of you or 100 of you. If it's one of you, it was worth the flight. Come on, can I get an amen? And here's what I want us to do. Come on. All you got to do... Well, why, why do I have to leave my seat? Because God will never ask you to do anything without taking a step. You gotta take a step. You gotta take a step. You gotta take one step. And with that one step, it's a declaration to the enemy that you're coming home, coming home, coming home. I'm not living in that lost world anymore, that broken world anymore. One, I'm coming back to the arms of a loving father, full of grace, full of compassion. Two, full of kindness and goodness. I'm ready to give my life to Jesus. You ready? Three. Come on, come on, come on. Let's sing, let's worship. Let's get some prayers.